Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine came and throughout the place in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But he came to himself and he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. Pig slop. Pig slop. Where does it stop? How did I get here? What did I do? How did I lose? What did I choose? Lose? Not yet. Not me. You may hear defeat, but I hear the drum beats. I know in my heart there is something more. Even if getting there is a chore. I know it's better than where I am. I know I will do it. I know I can. Today I choose not to lose. Today I know God loves me so. Even though I look as if I'm in a drift, every moment I live, I choose to be living in freedom eternally. I don't know how, no, not yet. But there is something more I get. The me that is here is not the me that is there. And I will get there no matter where. There is God in me. I, I feel it now. I'm rising up. I am growing now. Pray for me, will you? And I will pray for you. And I know that one day, we will all get there too. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. May God bless this reading. I remember many years ago when I, um, I'm going to go up here. I remember many years ago when I went up here. <laughs> I remember many years ago when I walked into a recovery room for the first time. And my journey is uh, one, like many of you, I, I was surprised how I got there. I remember when I walked in, I was really welcomed into a, a group of people I'd, I'd never met before, and 
This group became what's called a home group in recovery circles. It was a group I came back to every week. It was every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. And the truth is, I found God there. Now, many of you know I grew up in the church. I, um, my godfather was the minister. My mom was the president of the board. And if Red Oak United Methodist Church opened, it was because my family opened it. My brother was an organist. My sister played the piano, and I directed the choir. And my sister made the biscuits. I mean, you know, we were, we were it. We were doing it. And that was a wonderful, wonderful foundation for me. But somehow my view of God was limited. And as life would have it, I needed recovery and I didn't know it. I needed recovery and I didn't know it. All of us are recovering from something. Can I have an amen? amen. You don't have to be a 12-step program to need it. Or you may need one you don't know. Okay. <laughs> what I'm talking about today is the spiritual journey and your moment of awakening. Your moment of awakening. That story from the Bible, the prodigal son, is about a story of awakening. It says he came to himself and realized, how did I get here? Right? How did I get here? What's next? Uh, this, this something has to change. And all of us, if, definitely if we're in a unity church, however we grew up, whatever we baggage we brought with us, at some point we said, something needs to shift. That's our moment of awakening. Yes, we have to move forward, but without the awakening, you will never really move past where you are. You have to have an awakening that more is available to me. We've all had moments of awakening. Raise your hand if you feel you have. Look around the room. Yeah, all kinds of moments. And it doesn't have to just be one. As a matter of fact, what we begin to learn as we heal, every day, every moment can be a type of awakening. Amen? I mean, every day there's opportunity to awaken to more good, more God, more love, more grace for each one of us. Every day is an opportunity to awaken. But if you're here, you definitely have had a moment of awakening. It might be that the church of your childhood was no longer for you. It might be that you were in a healing, a physical healing journey. Many people come to unity in a physical healing journey. Many come after their relationships break up and they need healing. All of these things are moments of awakening. You know, I was thinking back to the time I walked into a recovery room, and a lot was going on at one time. The way I was doing life was not working anymore, and I knew that. That's what got me there. And God bless my friends there. I was in such bad shape. God bless me. Has anybody thought, oh, yeah, I was a mess? Or how about hot mess? Okay. So... Luckily, I had some friends who knew how to, who knew how to support me. One of them, uh, he was a former Golden Gloves champion in boxing. I just, we became really great friends. And after I'd known him a while, he said, sweetie, you need a therapist. <laughs> As a matter of fact, he said, I'll pay for your first therapy. He said, you can't say no. I said, no, I can't. I, I know an opportunity when I see it. I'm going. I'm going. So each moment of awakening, you know, helps another moment, helps another moment, helps another moment. We want to be looking for that awakening. We want to be ready to grow, to live, to live into that next awakening that we find ourselves in. It's easy to want to stay where we know, but we know that stagnant is we're either busy living or busy dying. There's, there's right, that's, that's the two options. Right, so... Say with me, I'm having my moment of awakening. Say that with me. I'm having my moment of awakening. I'm going to have it, and I'm going to have another and another and another. And I know you've already had one, but there's more to come. More to come. We're not done. And as a matter of fact, we want to be real careful thinking we're done. Amen? Amen? That spiritual ego can be so convincing. We think we've got it all together. We have the pamphlets. We've got the affirmations. We know, we know more.
more than anybody. That never changes a soul. Now, it might change you, but what will change another is your living example. It's never the words that you're saying to them in truth. It's never the words. It's the living example of what you're doing. As you awaken and you live into that awakening, that will change more lives than anything you, would, you could ever possibly say, right? Say to the person next to you, let's keep awakening. Let's keep awakening. Let's not forget. So moment of awakening, that's number one. Number two, telling the truth. Uh-oh. I heard it. Mm. Somebody else in here needs a therapist, it sounds like. <laughs> Secrets lead to sickness. We learned that. I've learned it in my own life. I've learned it in studying family systems, and I've learned it with congregation members and their families. When secrets are not spoken, it continues. The sickness continues, and it gets worse with each generation. I've seen it in my own family. I've seen it in the people I serve. What used to be uh, alcohol in a little pot has become crystal meth. It takes people down so fast. The drugs that are out there now are killer. If you've got kids, be talking about it right now. I don't care how old they are. Be talking about it. Tell them what's out there. Tell them what it does. Talk to them about it. Get help for your own secrets, parents. Because if we don't, it gets visited on our children and our grandchildren and so on and so on. We think, if I can just protect them, it won't happen. I don't have to say anything wrong. Truth have to be spoken. Speaking the truth for us is healing. Telling the truth is healing. Will you say that with me? Telling the truth is healing. The scriptures say you shall know the truth and the truth shall what? It's going to set you free. As long as you're living in your little head, in your little mind, and you think you've got it all figured out, that's where the sickness is. As a matter of fact, when I started telling the truth, I really started to heal because I could hear myself. And I also got real smart and got something called a sponsor. That was, that was good. And, of course, I chose the one with the most spiritual name in the group. Her name was Kathy Divine. <laughs> I said, that's mine right there. I pick you. We ended up, of course, becoming great friends as a sponsor sponsee relationship. You know, it's one of support. It's kind of a cross between an accountability, accountability partner and a mentor and somebody to say, have you lost your mind? <laughs> right? Or somebody to say, I got you. I'm right here. Right, in those times of stress. I'm going to tell on myself. That's what we say down south. I'm going to tell on myself. I'm going to tell the truth. I was in one of my um, times of connecting with my sponsor, and I was real excited about something. You know, I was always just telling her. I've always been a real verbal processor, you know. And so I was telling her how excited I was. She goes, well, what's going on with you? I said, I'm so excited because now my mom doesn't have to pay any money to call me long distance. Because, you know, my mom was in Georgia and I was in Seattle at that time. And, you know, back then, long distance was a thing. <laughs> you know, no more is that a thing because uh, well, of our cell phones and all that. But anyway, and she goes, what do you mean? I said, I found out so my mom doesn't have to pay to, to call me. And she said, what do you mean? I said, I bought a 1-800 number. And she goes, wow. And I said, what? I was like all excited. What? She said, did you know that's kind of backwards? I said, what? She said, no, no, no. Your mom is supposed to do that for you. And I said, oh. Well, who would I be if I wasn't taking care of everybody? She said, well, you would be you. I don't blame my mom for that. 
She never told me to buy the 1-800 number. Hear me. Blaming the parents thing is kind of over for me. I'm past that. Kind of grown up spirituality. And the relationship I have with my mom now is so dear. So much healing. And now that I have a son, I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> Bless you, honey. I know you are going to need therapy at times. <laughs> so that was another awakening, wasn't it, for me? I share this. I hope you're connecting with this. We all have these things. I didn't realize how sick I was till I said it out loud. Nobody made me take care of anybody. That was all on me. Somebody else would have responded totally differently, right? That's what my soul came here to learn this lifetime. So by telling the truth, I really got to see myself. My sponsor was a wonderful mirror to say, hey, let's look at this. Then I had to look at, do I have to make amends? Oh, my gosh. The answer is yes. That was more telling of the truth. But telling the truth brings healing for you and everybody around you. Now sometimes, and I have had this, there's people that don't want to hear the truth. Well, that's their journey. But sometimes it has to be spoken. So you can move forward. So you can move past the secrets that stay in your mind. Don't forget to tell the truth about what has happened, where you are, so you can get help and support. Through everything I'm saying, please hear for you here, there's always help and support. There's prayer chaplains every single Sunday. There's a meditation class every single Wednesday. There are classes every week. There are scads of people in recovery. We will hook you up with the right person to get you to a meeting if you need it. Whatever, If it's a health challenge, we have the people to support you in it. If, it, if it's an educational need, we will set you up with the right person. We will help you. We want to support you. Tell us the truth so that you can begin to heal on a deeper level. We see healing for you on every single level, mind, body, soul. But telling the truth is an important step. First, we have to have our awakening, though. We have to know we want to be somewhere different. Then we must tell the truth. Telling the truth heals our secrets. It's like they have us in bondage until we speak the truth. And then it begins to fall away, fall away, fall away. More and more freedom as the days, weeks, months, and years go on. Say to the person next to you, don't forget to tell the truth. You know, uh, I didn't say this last service, and I want to mention, um, you need to choose that person carefully. You want somebody, if you're talking to them, you want to make sure they can hold your emotional process. If the telling of the truth is about something that's happened, especially to you. So just be mindful of who you talk to, okay? The third thing I learned in early recovery is God is way bigger than I thought. <laughs> Will you say that with me? God is way bigger than I thought. See, I thought God was this white guy up on a throne. Don't, don't we all think that? Hollywood's given us that. Who is that actor that had that big, long, white beard? It's all I can see in my mind. But that's really not God. Who was it? Does somebody know who it was? Charlton Heston, was it? Well, he was Moses, I know. <laughs> Let my people go, you know. It's always strange how all those, in all those Jewish times, everybody has like an English accent. It's so strange. <laughs> Anyways. So, God is way bigger than I thought, and I learned that. So, um, so here I'm in my, in, in my journey. I'm, I'm like my late 20s, and I'm starting to, you know, do this 12-step thing, and, and my, I don't, maybe I didn't mention this, my, uh, my recovery program is Al-Anon. I love the addicts in my life. Uh, I love the addicts in my life, and um, 
So that was my recovery program. It's for family and friends of alcoholics, drug addicts, you know. And so, uh, and I went to some ACOA uh, groups too, checking those out, some CODA. But anyway, I landed in Al-Anon because that just felt like, you know, the right place. And that was happening. I told you I started my therapy. I started doing some really intensive work. And about that time, I also had this uh, physical healing journey that, that started. And, I mean, there was one day I just wanted to throw it all down and say, God, I need a break, man. Anybody ever feel like that? And you know what? It was like God said, this is it. What? Sometimes a break from God does look like that. Old aspects of me were being stripped away, weren't they? And God says, I got work for you to do, and you need to get healed up. Hurry up. Boom. Boom. Right? No more waiting for you, little one. Out you go. So healing had to happen. So the break from God sometimes looks different than we think. Often it does. And, you know, uh, so take my, my childhood view of God. Even though I've shared, you know, I used to be out in the woods and I would be hanging out with nature. And I learned later that was meditating. I didn't know that at the time. So I had a connection, but I didn't have like a language for it because in church I learned God was way up here. You know, and I was bad and I had to really work to get up there. And even on a good day, I mean, why try? I've already done half the sins anyways. You know, so it's like God was so far away. God was so far away. And then when I got into 12 step, it's like, oh, God is right here. And I heard people sharing about the God of my understanding. And, you know, uh, this, this thing in 12-step, you know, you don't, don't, you don't have to believe in God. It could be that doorknob over there. That's, I always thought that was so funny. I was like, who started that thing? But anyway, it could be that doorknob over there. It could be that. It could be anything. It just has to be God. You know, power greater than you. And, and then I had a friend. I got to know a lot of great people. And she says, well, I'm not into this God thing. The doorknob thing doesn't work for me. So my God is a black lesbian named Bubba. <laughs> and I said, I like this woman. <laughs> we became great friends with her, with, uh, with her and her husband. And, uh, I mean, what great people. And it just, like, totally freed me up to experience God everywhere. Then about that time... Shortly after that, I was singing in a gospel group. It was called the Pan-African Gospel Choir. And a friend of mine led it, and I made some other friends there. And one of the women in the group was um, a member at the Unity Church in Seattle there. And she invited me to church. I said, oh, no, honey, I, I can't come to your church. I got a church gig. I work for the Methodist Church. You know, I'm, I'm a Methodist. Died in the wool Methodist, honey. I came out practically at the church. My godfather was a minister. Mm -mm, no, I'm not unity. She said, well, you are. I said, I, I can't do it. I got a gig. About a month later, she said, I got a gig for you at my church. I said, sign me up. <laughs> Took the Sunday off. Now, I was already kind of like this with the church I was in because I kept trying to make it be something it wasn't. Little did I know I was trying to make it be unity. I didn't know. I said, you guys are so limited in your thinking. I was saying, you know, the audacity to say that to your, like, minister that you're working for. Anyway, so I found out. She So I went in, and the, I'll never forget the first thing the minister said when he prayed. He said, Mother, Father, God. I said, hmm. I'm listening. My it was another awakening moment because I felt like those two, those three words encompassed everything I knew about God already. I remember being little, questioning my mom about God. Why does it always bother God, you know? And my mom said, honey, if there's a father and a son, there's got to be a mama in there somewhere. <laughs> Holy Spirit, honey, that's the mama, God. Don't worry about it. My grandmother teaching me some of the native ways of Mother Earth. But when I heard Mother, Father, God, it brought it together. I said, ooh, this is something good. I got a little confused at one part, but that held me. I went home and quit my church job. I've been in unity ever since. As a matter of fact, I didn't tell the nine this. I'll tell you this real quick. 
Right after that, I went and quit my church job. I said, I don't know what this unity thing is, but I got, I got to have more. About that time, I had also just moved into a house with, unbeknownst to me, the president of the board at Unity. <laughs> and she said, I think I saw you rehearsing, you know, recently. Oh, you did? You know, anyway, long story short, she said, aren't you the drummer? I said, yeah. I, I, yeah, I play drums. She said, well, we just had a board meeting, and we talked about hiring a drummer, and if you want it, the job is yours. That's how I came into Unity. I have been here ever since. And it's, but it was the recovery, without the recovery journey, I don't think I ever would have found it. The recovery journey let me know just how big God could be. And in our ministry, you see that reflected. Every Sunday in our pews, we have someone who considers himself Catholic, Buddhist, Hindu, Christian, spiritual. And you know if you found yourself here, you are spiritual. Amen? Amen. So w most of us came from dogma, and, and I, especially on a Sunday where I know there's some visitors, I always like to say this, that um, ultimately our, our, um, our dogma is God and our creed is love. It's pretty simple. So if you're religious, usually you're scared of hell, going to hell. But if you're spiritual, you've been there and don't want to go back. Amen? <laughs> That's what we're about. Pretty much what we're about. I say it every so often over the years to make sure we just keep that in mind. We're a spiritual community here to support you on the journey. So I say all that to say wherever you may be on the journey... At your awakening moment, God is running towards you. You are never alone, even on the, even the times you feel like it. So when we have that moment of awakening, like that story, it's called the prodigal son. When we come to ourselves and realize, what am I doing here? And we turn and say, there is more. And we go towards God, ready to say, look how bad I was. Look how dumb I was. God says, come here. Whew. I got you. I'm going to put a ring on your finger and sandals on your feet and give you a fancy robe and good food. I'm going to fill you up because you're mine. All that time where we've wandered around not knowing what to do. We thought we lost ourselves, but you were never lost. You just thought you were. Your essence was always there, right there. Right there. Even now in this very moment. Right there. I see it. So my encouragement to you. It's the same as it is for me. Let's continue to wake up together to recover our essence. The spiritual journey, every time, every moment, every chance, every day, every situation is an opportunity to awaken, to recover that essence we think we've lost. So with that, let's move into our time of prayer and meditation. And remembering as we center and go within, God is right here with us as Don Barton leads our meditation. So I invite you now to take a few deep breaths, to become centered in this place, in this moment, knowing that all you need to do is breathe. And if you feel comfortable, gently close your eyes and listen to that breath with a deep inhale and exhale fully. And as you breathe, recognize the molecules of oxygen that are flowing in and through you from each breath into your bloodstream and throughout your entire body. That that air is supplying all that you need 
with each exhale, you have more oxygen than you could use and you breathe it back out into the world. And every person in this room has enough. And the air that we breathe is the same that they breathe on the other side of the planet. And in that air is the same fulfillment of oxygen, all that they need. In and through every cell of their body and every animal and every plant is surrounded by that presence of all that they need. All that I need is here, right now, in this moment. I am supported by the presence of God, breathing in the same divinity that's being breathed by every person on the planet. God is that big. And I recognize that oneness, that connection, and all that it brings in this moment. I have joy and peace and favor. And for a few moments, I feel what it is to be full of that loving presence. There is only one presence, one power, one perfect action in the world and in my life. God, the good, here and now, in and through me. And I feel those gifts of joy and love and favor. The oxygen I breathe gives me power and strength reinvigorates, rejuvenizes as each cell recovers from any damage, any harm, any injury. Starting from the cellular level out, I am able to recover and become more than I am in this moment. Surrounded and supported by God's love, God's presence, God's power. I claim it in this moment for this hour, during this day, and throughout this lifetime, and so it is, amen and amen.